All right. Uh, yeah. Good afternoon, everyone, um, or morning, or wherever you are. Uh, so I will tell you a few things about um, inelastic nuclear recoil. So I think you've probably already uh, heard in this in this lecture series about uh, elastic nuclear recoils, how how people look for them, and experiments like xenon super CDMS and so on, as well as uh, electron recoils uh, from uh, Tian Tian's le lecture from last week. So we'll talk about inelastic nuclear recoils and explain what, what, what that means and how we compute uh, things. So this is a theory on the theory side of things. So first we're viewing a few things about uh, elastic nuclear recoils. And so this is presumably very familiar to you by now. Oh, my cat is a bit confused about the situation, so he might show up uh, once in a while. Uh, so, so this is, uh, if we're just uh, enforcing uh, the kinematic constraint uh, by putting the nucleus on shell with mu x, and I, I take here to be the reduced mass of the dark matter uh, and the nucleon, the nucleus that you're scattering with, and mn is nucleus mass, you can just show by energy momentum conservation that the amount of energy that the, nuclear can, the nucleus can receive when recoiling uh, is always bounded from above by this function, which I plotted here on the right. Uh, and as you see, it maxes out uh, roughly uh, around a couple of keV, which is, of course, the reason why uh, experiments like uh, uh, xenon, super CDMS, LUX, and so on have thresholds in this ballpark or so, so they can see these nuclear recoils. Uh, it flattens off at, at very high uh, masses, which means that if the dark matter becomes very, very heavy, uh, you still only have a maximum amount of kinetic energy that you can extract uh, from it. And th this is why the, the, the reach of, of most of these experiments peaks sort of in the GV to 100 GV regime or so, because you can maximally extract kinetic energy. So we're going to be interested in the lower mass uh, regime over here. And so you see the fraction of kinetic energy that you can extract from the nucleus uh, uh, drops. And the reason is just that you have um, a very light object recurring at something heavy, so it's very difficult to uh, extract uh, energy while conserving momentum if you have an elastic recoil. Uh, and so the two questions that we're going to be addressing in the lectures today and tomorrow, uh, tomorrow we're going to look at uh, this, this very low mass region over here, below uh, an MEV, uh, roughly MEV and below um, of dark matter mass. And we'll see that at this point, this curve is no longer true. And so this, this picture breaks because the, the Broad wavelength of the dark matter is longer than the interparticle spacing and you no longer have a nuclear recoil. Uh, in, in, in the usual sense of the world. So you, so you have to coherently scatter against multiple nuclei all at once. Uh, and, uh, but, but today we're gonna sort of look at uh, slightly higher dark matter masses between you know, an MeV roughly and uh, a few GeV or so. And we're gonna see if we can uh, live in this space in between here, extract more kinetic energy of the dark matter by doing an inelastic recoil um, at, at, at the price of some some amount of cross section, so we're you know, looking for for subleading processes, but where we can uh, uh, extract more energy from the collision. And so that's what we're going to compute today. Uh, so kinetic energy is generally too low for for exciting nuclear excitations. So we're basically always thinking about electromagnetic excitations, uh, and there are two types of those. So so one uh, is is the process computed by uh, Yosef and. Uh, uh, Chris Kubara is like a number of years ago, which is just uh, Bram's trialing. So your dark matter comes in, it hits the nucleus, and the nucleus emits a photon uh, off, off the, nuclear, the, 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 the line of the ion over here. Uh, the second process is very similar, but involves uh, having uh, electrons in the final state. And this is, this is called the Migdal effect, uh, after Migdal, who came up with it, uh, who first studied this in, in, in the 40s or so. Of course, not in the context of dark matter, but in, in the context of standard model processes. And here are two different uh, uh, categories to consider. You can do this in atoms and you can do this in crystals. Uh, and we'll see that uh, there are some important differences to account for uh, when we do this. Here are a few references. So the, the Migdal is, the, this is the original paper where uh, this was first com computed in the context of standard model physics. And then uh, here in the Bernabe paper, oops, is, to my knowledge, the first paper that pointed out that you could use this for dark matter detection. And, and I, usually there are many papers for, for the Migdal effect, uh, but I like to give you the reference to this eBay paper, which in, in my mind is sort of, uh, is, is an extremely detailed and long paper, which has a lot of things worked out in, in detail that you can go look at if, if you want. 
All right, so let's uh, first start uh, with uh, Bremsstrahlung. So, so what you're doing is you have these two different diagrams, as usual for Bremsstrahlung, where you can attach the photon, uh, photon either at the final state or at the initial state uh, nucleus. Uh, and uh, a few features of this, the, this uh, sort of process, of course, square these amplitudes, there is some amount of destructive interference going on, as usual, at Bremsstrahlung. Uh, it's a leading order process in alpha, so there is a, there's a fine structure constant that you have to pay over here. So it's, it's of course, much smaller, therefore, than just a regular elastic process. And, and you, in principle, also have to deal with uh, a three-body phase space, uh, which also suppresses the rate a bit. Uh, especially this latter, in principle, is, is somewhat annoying in a non-relativistic uh, model. However, uh, we tend to benefit from uh, what's called the soft limit, uh, which means that if the, the momentum that's flowing through this photon line over here uh, is small compared to the overall momentum uh, in, in this ion line, uh, we, can, we can make an expansion and essentially factorize this process as um, an elastic process times a, a probability of emitting a Bramstrahlung photon. Uh, this is something that you can find computed in a relativistic model uh, in, I think, chapter six of Pesking and Schroeder. Uh, if, if, if which you presumably at some point have worked through. Uh, but what we're going to be looking at is the non-relativistic version of this. And so this holds generally if um, the, the energy deposited in the photon, uh, denoted here by omega, uh, is smaller the, than the momentum transfer times the velocity of the dark matter. And here are just for some characteristic uh, choices of parameters with the velocity to be taken as 10 to the minus three as usual. Uh, this is of the order of uh, tens of kV. And so so the, the, the idea that uh, Chris and jo Joseph uh, pointed out uh, a number of years ago is that detectors like xenon, CDMS, and so on can very easily see uh, kV photons because uh, those photons tend to produce an a strong ionization signal uh, in, in those uh, uh, dual phase TPCs or in those, those uh, germanium detectors. Uh, and so you can very easily satisfy this limit uh, and, and work in a soft approximation where you effectively just factorize uh, the elastic process from the elastic uh, piece, uh, which makes the calculation much more manageable. Uh, so first thing you do is you're computing this uh, in a free ion approximation. So you're just assuming that uh, there's just an ion with a, a charge uh, Z uh, and you can do the, the classical calculation, either uh, using Pesky and Schroeder and taking an altruistic limit, or uh, uh, in, in a book by Dave Jackson. Many of you probably worked through this type of calculation before. So you just get the elastic cross-section as a function of the recoil energy multiplied by this uh, prefactor over here, where omega max is just the overall, the total amount of kinetic energy that's carried by the dark matter in this case. Uh, so this is this is a first uh, first guess, a first approximation. It's not great, uh, and the reason is that um, the 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 remaining electrons in the nucleus uh, around the nucleus provide screening. So it's not super obvious from the beginning what you should choose for this this charge Z over here, since this is a um, energy momentum dependent uh, object. Given that the shorter wavelength you're probing. Uh, the, the nucleus with the, the, the less screening you have and the higher this charge is going to be. So in the end, what you end up doing is you replace uh, this charge with a momentum, de a frequency dependent charge or an energy dependent charge in this case. Uh, and so you can show uh, that this relates to the polarizability of the atom, uh, which is also conventionally called alpha. So you have two alphas over here. This is the fine structure constant and this is the polarizability of the atom. And this is the electron mass over here. Uh, and so the details you can you know, review in, in Joseph's paper. Uh, and so, so as, as it should, this object in the limit where you're probing it at very, very high energies, it's just the folds to the total, oops, to the total uh, charge of, of the ion. Uh, and if you probe it at zero frequency, then this object goes to zero because you're just seeing the entire atom as a whole and you have perfect screening basically. Uh, what's nice about this is that uh, this polarizability uh, of the atom is something that you can simply extract from measured data uh, and, and, and use in this type of calculation over here. Uh, so this is what, what is shown in this plot over here. So here you see, uh, this is for an example of dark, a dark matter mass of 1 GeV with xenon, uh, xenon target. Uh, and you see the elastic recoil is much, much higher. 
Uh, but at some point, it 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 drops for the reasons that we we showed. You can, can energy. There's a lot of kinetic energy that's available to you. However, you cannot access it uh, in an elastic recoil. And so, if you have an experiment which has a threshold, let's say, of one kV or so, just a hypothetical experiment, you are not able to see uh, this this process at all. The bram stalling process is suppressed by six orders of magnitudes or so. Uh, but it extends to much higher uh, energies. And so you can pick up this tail over here uh, and still uh, search for it or set the limit. The difference between the solid and the dashed line is the dashed line is uh, uh, the, the calculation where you, you, you don't account for the frequency dependence of the effective charge. Uh, while the solid line, you see there's a quite a bit of, this is a fairly large log log plot. So you see there's a substantial difference uh, from, from accounting for that as well. So now uh, we're moving on uh, to the Migdal effect, which is um, quite similar uh, in some ways, but different than others. Uh, and so the usual uh, explanation here is uh, that you have, uh, you have a nucleus, it has some electrons sitting around uh, with some wave functions, the dark matter comes in, uh, it kicks the nucleus, and as the nucleus rushes away, uh, this process, you usually assume that this happens adiabatically so that the wave functions don't have, the electron wave functions don't have enough time to really adapt to the changing situation, so the nucleus is rushing away, and so one or more of the electrons find themselves left behind, uh, and so we see that as ionization. So that, that's sort of how Migdal uh, in the original paper was uh, thinking about it and was explaining it. Uh, now there is a sort of a more microscopic uh, explanation, which is, is completely equivalent, uh, but this is very useful for us to keep in mind. Uh, and this is as an, an, an analog to, to the bram stalling process that we saw before. Uh, in a sense, what happens is, so here I slightly modified Joseph's figure, where uh, the dark matter comes in, it hits the nucleus, the nucleus goes slightly off shell, uh, and it produces a, a, a disturbance, a virtual photo, if you want, or a disturbance in the electric field around uh, the atoms. Uh, and this causes uh, an electron hole pair being produced. So an electron gets ionized and a hole is left behind, either in the ion or in the crystal. Uh, and so this makes it a little bit more clear that this is effectively also uh, some form of bram straling and it's, it's suppressed by, again, suppressed by uh, an, uh, two powers in this case of the uh, fine structure constant. Uh, by the way, I, I think I forgot to mention the, uh, maybe over here, if you don't mind uh, that I go back for a second, uh, you see this very, very large uh, gap over here between uh, the elastic and the uh, uh, Bramstrahlen uh, uh, contributions. Uh, and so this is not fully explained just by one power of alpha, but you see over here, uh, what's typical with these Bramstrahlen processes that there is also suppressed by uh, the energy of the nuclear recoil, which of the order of a few kV, divided by the mass of the, of the nucleus that's, uh, that's recoiling, uh, which in the case of xenon has an atomic number of something like 130 or so. So this is a really large uh, suppression that you get. Something to keep in mind, I should have mentioned that. Uh, so so back, to, back to the Migdal effect. Uh, so so it's, it's also a form of, of Bram Strahling in a way. And so that's what you're seeing, seeing in this process. Um, and they're going to analyze this in a little bit of detail. Uh, what the Migdal effect is not, and is sometimes confused by, is, is these, what's called these quenching factors that you may have seen uh, in some of the more experimental talks. Uh, so if, a, if an ion gets hit by dark matter, it travels to the crystal, and it produces a bunch of electrons down the road because it hits other ions, uh, and they start exciting more electrons. And so you get a shower of, of, of additional ions and electrons down, down the road in the crystal. But these are secondary ionization electrons. They're not coming from the initial heart process, uh, which is what the, the Migdal effect describes. So these are, it's the same physics in some, in some sense, but they're, they're taking place on very different time scales. And so this is very important stuff, especially now uh, people are trying to understand what's happening at very low nuclear recoils. Uh, and in particular, you see there's the theory prediction from Lindhardt from the 60s is this dashed line over here. Uh, so, so you see it over here, while uh, this is some new experimental data, which uh, cannot quite uh, explain this uh, at the moment. So this is anomaly in the standard model somehow. 
Um, but this is not something that's due to the Migdal effect. So it's a different, different thing. Okay, so uh, as you, if, if you have ever looked at uh, any of these things, you may have noticed that uh, notation is a major, uh, a major barrier uh, to, towards understanding what's written in, in many of these papers uh, because you're doing either uh, solid state physics or complex matter uh, or atomic physics. Uh, for which there is, uh, you know, the wave functions can be quite complicated and, and the notation tends to be somewhat involved. Um, so here I'm going to try to focus mostly just on the sort of big picture physics uh, and avoid uh, specifying all the quantum numbers of the individual initial and final states of the adamantic crystal. So I'm just going to label the initial state with I and the final state with F. Uh, so that means that I can freely switch between talking about atoms and crystals. So, so if I'm talking about an atom, uh, you have to keep in mind that these i's and f's will be labeled by the usual l, m, and m quantum numbers. Well, if we're talking about crystals, uh, they will be represented by block wave functions. These are the energies of the initial and final states uh, of these, these states. En and Vn are going to be the energy and the velocity of the recoiling nucleus, and then the precision operators of uh, uh, the, the um, nucleus is going to be um, denoted by R sub n, and the Greek indices will refer to a particular electron labeled by this index. And then finally, omega and k are the energy momentum deposited specifically into the electron. So when I'm referring to q, that's going to be the momentum uh, deposited into the nuclei. OK, so how, how do we compute uh, this thing? So the way it's, you can, one way to compute it is using uh, the trick that Migdal uh, used uh, back in the 30s. Uh, and so what he is, was essentially saying is what we already mentioned before, if uh, you hit the nucleus sufficiently hard, the electron cloud doesn't have enough time to, to really adjust, uh, which means that uh, after the collision, you can effectively boost to the rest frame of the nucleus. And so you boost the electron cloud in the other direction. Uh, and so that will be a pretty good approximation of, of the excited uh, electron wave. So that's over here. Um, so basically, we're moving to the rest frame of the recoiling nucleus. So that, that means that the initial state of the electron cloud uh, is boosted in this frame by this operator. This is just the usual boost operator uh, in uh, normalistic quantum mechanics uh, acted on, on this state. Uh, and the final uh, uh, matrix element is just wedging this object into um, whatever final state that you happen to be interested in. So this is the matrix element that, uh, uh, that Migdal derived in this way. Uh, and what you can do is you can say, well, okay, the, the velocity of this nucleus is fairly small. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty heavy object. It got a kick of a couple kV. Um, so, so we can expand this exponential, uh, bring this up front. And uh, the matrix element that you end up getting here is this uh, sum over all the position coordinates of, of the electrons wedged between the initial and the final states. Uh, and so this is the transition dipole matrix element. Uh, of the atom in this case that you can you can uh, compute if you have access to these uh, various wave functions uh, f and i. Uh, these wave functions are uh, of course this is atomic physics so this is uh, this is a problem that's been solved uh, numerically a long time ago. Uh, so if you want you can do your own approximate calculation using hydrogen wave functions. Uh, but what these folks did. Uh, uh, in this Japanese group in, in 2017, uh, they use something called a flexible atomic code, FFAC, uh, which uh, is a numerical package which computes these wave functions for you in whatever atom you want. Uh, and so they went through a long list of atoms, xenon, germanium, all the, all the things that you might want for direct detection. They computed all those wave functions, uh, and then they computed these uh, transition matrix elements. And from that, you can derive uh, the uh, differential probability. So the probability per unit of energy of exciting uh, going, yeah, in, in a dark matter collision going from an initial state I to an excited state F uh, in, um, in, in your atom. Uh, so this be painful. Uh, it's a fairly long paper. There's a lot of details in there. Uh, but thankfully, uh, for the rest of us, they provided tabulate. So they tabulated all this stuff. And so you can download it with their paper, and you can basically uh, just use it without ever having to really access this, this code again. Uh, what you're seeing over here is an example uh, for xenon. Uh, and so, so they, they're showing here the initial state 
uh, is labeled for the different uh, energy shells uh, from one to five, where they uh, sum together all the L and the M uh, quantum numbers. Uh, and these are the ionization probabilities here that they, that they plotted. So the probability for kicking off an electron uh, from a shell, the, the five shell in this case, uh, all the way to infinity. And so you're seeing unsurprisingly that uh, at low uh, uh, energies, the, uh, the highest shells are the most easy to ionize. So you, you have the highest probability for, for, uh, for kicking one of those electrons out over here. Uh, and then once you go to higher and higher energies, these start dropping and uh, the sort of inner shells uh, start uh, uh, playing a role as well. Um, now, so this calculation uh, has a couple drawbacks um, in, in the sense that uh, the Bremsstrahlung analogy that we made earlier is, is, is not so clear. So for instance, what in, in, this, in this formula that we showed, uh, there's no, where is the Z ion somehow, right? So you expect some powers of alpha, you expect some uh, dependence on the ion charge somehow. Uh, and, the, and the boosting stuff also feels a bit awkward, right? This is always something you can really do in any system. Uh, and, and so, so you know, we, we know quantum mechanics, so we should be able to do a straight up calculation of the lab frame, you know, just with time dependent perturbation theory without any, uh, any, any issues. So, so let's, let's try to do that. So what we have here is a time dependent Hamiltonian. So, so the, the, the sort of unperturbed Hamiltonian is H zero. So this is just a Coulomb potential where each of the electrons uh, feels the ion with the charge Zn, which for now I'm taking to be just a fixed number. So you make it frequency dependent if you want, which is in fact, in fact important, but for, for the sake of notation, I'm not gonna do that here. And then the fine structure constant. And there is additional electron electron interactions, which we're gonna neglect for now. Uh, and then the pertur perturbation to this, this uh, 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 unperturbed Hamiltonian is, is uh, the, the ion gets a kick uh, starting at T zero and it, it, uh, we assume that it just rushes away with a constant velocity Vn. So its position is uh, given by this. Uh, and so this is the, the perturbed Hamiltonian. This extra piece here is important because it has to cancel off uh, uh, this piece over here, oops. Uh, because at finite t, you're really just seeing this, right? So this has to cancel off. Um, and so you can, again, uh, expand this uh, in, in this small velocity, and then you get this. Uh, and what you're seeing over here, this is just the dipole potential, uh, as you might expect from, from the discussion that we already, already had before. This is uh, assuming that t uh, is sufficiently small. So we're looking at time scales very shortly after the collision of the dark matter with the nucleus. Uh, this is the transition probability, which you can just get with uh, time-dependent perturbation theory. I put in a little bit of a, a small uh, dissipation parameter, uh, eta over here, just to make this integral converge. In the end of the calculation, you can send this thing to zero uh, and, and things will work out fine. Uh, and what you end up getting is, is basically this, this matrix element. So this is the square of the transition probability. Now let's compare this uh, with Migdal. Uh, and so, so uh, this is this is this is not entirely great, right? Because so this is this is a Migdal's uh, matrix element uh, that we saw before, and this is the one that you get with uh, perturbation theory. So you see the ZN, you see the alpha. Uh, the R depends is different. The only thing that these things have going for them is that clearly there is a sum over uh, R or over the position coordinates on both sides, and there is like a, the velocity uh, is also in there. But other than that, they don't really look very similar. Uh, and so we have to understand uh, what's going on. I, I know that I slightly cheated here in the sense that from this step over here, you can't really derive this prefactor i, uh, though, though I, I know it has to be i because there's a, yet another way you can compute this. Um, but let, let's not get into that. Let's just, if hopefully you'll accept for now that this, is, that this, this phase is correct. So let's figure out like why why are these things different uh, and how, how can we reconcile these, these seemingly very different results with two very simple calculations in some ways. Um, so first, uh, so we have to keep in mind that we are just talking about uh, uh, this is the Hamiltonian of any sort of electromagnetic system. So this is the um, momenta of the electrons that I'm summing over the kinetic terms. And crucially, the potential is just a central potential, it's a Coulomb potential, so it doesn't depend 
uh, on the momenta of the electron. It just depends on the, the coordinates of the electrons, the position coordinates and the position coordinate of uh, the, the nucleus. So that means <clears throat> that we have these two operator identities, which are essentially just the Hamilton-Jacobi equations of, these, uh, of, of this Hamiltonian. So the, the commutator of, of uh, R with uh, H0 is, is given by the electron momenta just from this piece over here. Uh, and if I take the commutator of um, the momenta with uh, this the Hamiltonian, I get the derivative of the potential, which is also known as the force, the total force exerted on uh, the total force exerted on um, the electron labeled with beta. All right, so here is a, we take a few steps. So we start with the Migdal uh, matrix element. Uh, and so what we can always do is we can insert uh, uh, a power of the Hamiltonian, since these are eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, right? So if I act with H0 on I, I pick up uh, the energy EI. If I act with it on um, F, I pick up uh, EF. And the difference between these is what we call omega. That's the total energy that's added to the system. Uh, so I can always write, rewrite this uh, by dividing out by omega and then putting in a commutator over here. Uh, this, this is something I can do. Then uh, I use uh, this operator relation over here. So I can replace this commutator with uh, a sum over, over the electron uh, momentum. Uh, I can repeat the same trick that we used over here by just, uh, again, using the fact that uh, if H acts on, e, uh, on I, I get this. Uh, I get the I. If H acts on F, I get the F. And again, correct for that by adding an, an additional power of one over omega uh, in the numerator. And then finally, uh, using this second operator relation uh, where we substitute in this uh, derivative of uh, um, <clears> the <throat> potential with respect to the electron uh, position, also known as the force acting on this electron. So this is starting to look a little bit more uh, in line with uh, the other result. Uh, so this is that same derivation, just repeating it here just for, uh, for your convenience. Uh, and so now all we have to do is stick in uh, this, the, the, the Coulomb uh, expression for, for, for this potential over here, uh, which is what you're seeing over here. This is the force, the Coulomb force essentially. Uh, and the final step is where we just, uh, oh, and yeah, crucially here, this is the total force exactly on all the electrons. But since I'm summing over all the electrons, uh, all the electron-electron interactions, because there are forces that go in opposite directions, will all cancel each other. So really the only thing that the sum is seeing is the force from the, from the actual nucleus, uh, which, is, which is what's, uh, what's shown over here. Um, and then finally, in the last step, uh, we are, we're gonna look at this at time scales very shortly after the collision. So the, the position of the dark matter of, of the nucleus is, is, is small uh, compared to uh, the position of the electrons. In other words, the nucleus has only moved a little bit compared to the size of the overall uh, electron cloud. Um, and so with those assumptions, we recover um, the matrix element that we computed uh, directly with perturbation theory. So, so all is well, uh, life is good. You know, we can make all this right and we are also right when we're doing uh, regular uh, perturbation theory that we all know and love. Now, uh, there is an important subtlety here, right? Uh, and so this, the subtlety uh, is sitting over here. So it's in this step where we uh, uh, plugged in uh, this, this force over here. And this assumes that there is only one nucleus that exerts a force on the electrons, uh, which is the, the nucleus that uh, uh, got the, the, the recoil. This has got recoiled by, by the dark matter. Uh, and this is fine if we're talking about isolated atoms, but if we're talking about crystals, this assumption breaks. Uh, and the reason is that the electron wave functions, as you learned from Tian Tian last week, are very, uh, they're very delocalized. So they're shared by many, many uh, atoms. Uh, and so all the electrons feel a large number of atoms other than just the, the one that, that you recoil. Uh, so this, this is here is, is an equivalent in this case. Sorry about that. There's a, someone who's also very excited here this morning. Um, uh, so they, yeah, so both, both calculations are equivalent, but only for atomic targets. And so in hindsight, maybe this shouldn't have been so surprising in the sense that if I have a crystal, uh, I effectively uh, broke Lorentz invariance in the sense that there is a preferred frame, uh, namely the crystal frame, 
And this whole boosting business is no longer really a good thing to do. Because if I, if I were to boost it, I have to also boost all the other atoms in the crystal and subtract those contributions back off uh, from the matrix element if I'm computing it using uh, Migdal's trick. And so those additional contributions that I would subtract off are exactly the, the ones that are uh, missing over here if, if we naively apply this to atoms, to, to, to crystals, uh, let's say. Uh, so that means that uh, uh, when we're computing the Migdal effect for crystals, what we want to do is we want to use uh, the, the perturbative calculation rather than the Migdal trick, because the Migdal trick is, um, is, is more elaborate and, and, and more complicated in that case. Now, so, so uh, in, the, in the rest, we will go uh, a little bit more into the details on how to do this for crystals, but uh, in the meanwhile, I'll, I'll give you some intermediate conclusions over here. So the Migdal effect is, is quite analogous to Bram's trialing, but the main difference here is now that the photon is virtual and it excites a number of electrons rather than going off uh, to, to uh, hit the, the next atom uh, down the road by itself. Uh, and so the Migdal trick is, is equivalent to a perturbative calculation if you're doing atoms. Uh, and so, so just, just to let, let you know that this is not sort of an academic exercise, that this is something that's really been used uh, very intensively by, by experiments. Like here's an example from the xenon one ton collaboration from a few years ago. Uh, and uh, this is the limits of dark matter mass versus cross section where they normalize this in a somewhat funny way because they were looking at a, a massless mediator in this case. So M phi is the, lim is the, is the mass of the mediator which they then sent to zero, but um, those details are not so important here. But what, what you can see is that they set very nice limits uh, using uh, both the Migdal effect and then this is the bram uh piece, uh, which is a bit, is a bit uh, less sensitive due to this, this suppression that we talked about earlier of the recoil over uh, the mass of the nucleus. Um, and yeah, you see that they, they reach, you know, that this experiment is not supposed to be able to probe anything below, you know, five to 10 GeV dark matter mass, but using this trick, uh, they can go down to, to basically 100 MeV dark matter mass, even, which is pretty remarkable for a uh, 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 liquid xenon TPC. All right, any, any questions so far about, uh, about the first part? I don't know if I can see hands, so. Yes, be... there's one raised hand by yeah. Gova, please. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I have a small question that, is it yeah. always the situation that premature lung will be subdominant? Is it always true in every scenario? Right now looks like uh, it's a specific scenario when you're considering a specific type of interaction, isn't it? Um, I think so, although Joseph may have thought about this a bit more in a bit more detail. I mean, the, the reason is that uh, this takes, so, so you hit the nucleus in some way, either it's spin dependent, spin independent, that somewhat factorizes from, from, uh, from what happens afterwards, right? I mean, so, so the, yeah, the nucleus recoil, like recoils, it, it gets kinetic energy and then it emits either electrons or, or photons. Um, so I'm inclined to think that it's independent on the initial, the type of initial heart collision. But Joseph, if you have thought more about this, feel free to weigh in. Yeah, hi Simon, I, I, I share your pessimism on that too. Yeah. Thank you. It seems pretty much uh, subliding. Um, okay, any more questions? Then let's move to the second half. Uh, so we're gonna talk a little bit about crystals. Uh, and so the thing with crystals is that they're complicated. And I think uh, since, since you've had Tientian's lectures already, uh, you're, you're probably aware of uh, all of these things, that electrons are not free, they're not at rest, they're not localized, and they're also not alone, uh, which means that things get a bit messy over here. Uh, and you have to essentially compute uh, the block wave functions of, of the various electrons, which is a plot I took from one of Tientian's papers. Uh, and those are obtained usually with the density functional theory, uh, which is essentially what that means as a particle physicist is that you run some fancy computer code uh, that was uh, written by Columbus Matter experts. This is not something that you should go off and try to uh, implement yourself. I mean, there's many good software packages like Quantum Express or GPA uh, or VASP, 
which, which do these things. Some of them are commercial, some of them are open source. Um, but so once you have these things, you can, in principle, uh, deal with the electrons, but we still have to set up the calculation properly, which is what we're going to try to do now. Uh, the next subtlety is, is that ions are also not really free anymore because they they feel the presence of the, their neighboring ions. Uh, and so that means that um, uh, if the dark matter is sufficiently light, that the, the ion will know that it sits inside a potential well. Um, and so, so what this is over here, as you see, the, the size of the potential well is roughly, I approximated here as a harmonic uh, potential, which is a bit crude, but uh, it, it will do for now. Um, it, it's roughly one angstrom in size, so that's the interparticle spacing and, and typical crystal. It takes about 20, 20 to 50 EV or so to uh, uh, kick and uh, to dislocate the ion basically. So that it goes out of its potential well and it keeps rolling uh, through the crystal. Um, now, so, so what's important here is that, uh, so, so you're hitting the nucleus here with, uh, with uh, some force. Uh, and so this energy, is recoil energy might be quite a bit less uh, than 20 EV. Uh, however, what matters for the Migdal effect, which happens instantaneously after the, uh, the initial hard collision, uh, is that the energy of the nucleus is, is large compared to the gradient of this potential well over here, not to the overall size uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the potential. Uh, and so this is the same thing that you'd have in particle physics, right? So if you, if you hit a proton hard enough, you care about the, the particles that are inside uh, and not so, so much about the hadronization process that will happen later as long as you're interested in an inclusive uh, inclusive process, so which is what we're going to be interested in here. So you hit this thing at a fairly fast, a fairly short time scale. Uh, it starts rolling up this hill, but immediately emits some electrons. And then once it sort of reaches the top of this hill, it's going to start relaxing by emitting phonons and it eventually settles back to its ground state. Um, but as long as this assumption remains true, we can uh, separate these things. Uh, and so this is known as the impulse approximation uh, in a crystal. Uh, is very similar to what uh, Migdal assumed for, for the atom, but it's a slightly stronger in this case. Uh, and uh, yeah, essentially it means that uh, the initial state is a bound, the wave function of the, of the ion is, is, is a bound state in this harmonic potential. But for the purpose right after this, uh, in this collision, uh, we can approximate the wave function of the ion as a plane wave. Uh, and so that's what we what we use in order to if the impulse approximation is satisfied. Uh, I set this, and I think I said this. So we're basically separating the long distance physics phonons from, from uh, uh, the Migdal effect, which is the short distance physics. Uh, to 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 verify when this is actually a good thing to do, we have to uh, make a quick foray into soft nuclear recoils, uh, which we'll talk more about tomorrow. Uh, and so here, for simplicity, we're going to do this for, for one instance uh, without the Migdal effect. So we just have like a nuclear recoil, soft nuclear recoil, see, see how the, the ion responds. Uh, and so suppose that the, the dark matter ion interaction is uh, just a, a you know, contact interaction. So it's really this delta function over here, where r is the position coordinate of the dark matter. Uh, we free transform this, and so you get this e to the i uh, qr uh, that's, that's familiar. Uh, from any time you did Born approximation stuff. Uh, the scattering process in this uh, business is always described by Fermi's golden rule, which we're very familiar with. Uh, in uh, Congress matter speak, this is called the dynamical structure factor, which you may have seen already in these lectures before. It's essentially just this matrix element where lambda i and lambda f are now the initial and final state of the nuclei. So I, I, I stuck in a lambda here just to differentiate from the i, f, the i and f final states, initial states from before, which we're dealing with the electrons. Uh, and of course, energy conservation. So this is the object you want to compute, basically. Uh, and so let's try to see, let's compute this, and, and let's see when the impulse approximation is something that you can really assume. Uh, so the way this is computed is, is very similar to if you've ever uh, gone through the calculation in Peskin and Schroeder in chapter six for the spectral density uh, in a relativistic QFT. So this is a very similar, similar thing over here. Uh, so what you end up doing is you're un we're unpacking, so Fourier transforming this uh, uh, delta function over here. So we get this e to the i omega, this in time integral, and uh, we unpacked 
we, we, we basically wrote this out fully as uh, the matrix Elman times this complex conjugate and stuck in these two I, these two energy factors, uh, these phase factors and, and this one over here. Uh, since these are eigenstates of the system, uh, this is equivalent with acting with the Hamiltonian on this final state. And this is equivalent to acting with the Hamiltonian on this final state. Uh, and so then I have two Hamiltonians wedging uh, this uh, phase factor over here, which essentially means I'm time evolving this uh, operator. So essentially the, the structure factor is equivalent to this time dependent correlation function of these two phase factors over here and then the Fourier transform of that thing. Now there's a, a couple, there's a, about a page of algebra which involves a bunch of Hausdorff uh, formulas and so on, which is not particularly illuminating uh, that you can do. And then you end up with uh, 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 something like this, where this object here is the, called the Bayer-Waller factor. Um, so this measures basically, this is the ion self-correlation. So it measures how localized the ion, the ion is in, in space. So for us, usually it's, it's pretty localized, so we can usually neglect uh, this thing. Uh, and then here you have the same uh, object as here, except that now note that the expectation values are in the exponent rather than in uh, around the exponent over here, which is the crucial difference here. So if you know this correlation function here, you can compute this thing uh, to, to all orders essentially. Uh, and in general, this is a very difficult task. However, if we're assuming that this is a harmonic potential uh, or, or, or periodic harmonic potential, so there's a bunch of them uh, on the other side as well, uh, then this is not such a difficult task because we, we know how to quantize, we know how to solve the harmonic oscillator basically. Uh, and this is, this is essentially the answer. Uh, where D over here is the density of states uh, in, in the crystal. Um, so if you want to review the full derivation, you can find it in this appendix over here. Uh, but this is essentially just a few lines by just uh, writing this in terms of creation and annihilation operators uh, and then acting on the vacuum, you can, you can find this, this, this simple formula. Um, now, in the impulse approximation, you can show that this entire thing asymptotes to a Gaussian, uh, which looks like this, uh, uh, where omega bar here is a typical phonon frequency. Uh, and so this thing, again, in the, if you go even higher energies, a very, very high momentum limit, uh, this asymptotes to a delta function, which corresponds to the free recoil. Uh, in terms of plots, what it looks like is, is this. Uh, so we start at very low momentum, which are normalized uh, uh, according to this, this uh, you know, the square root of uh, the phonon frequency with the mass of the ion that's recoiling. Uh, and so I use the simple debate density of states over here. So you see this triangle is just the debate density of states. Uh, and so this is essentially um, one phonon is being produced. And the red line is the impulse approximation is absolutely terrible. It just models really poorly. Once you go to slightly higher momentum, you have a single phonon and you see a two phonon peak starts popping up. Uh, even higher momentum, single phonon, two phonons, three phonons, and a little bit of a hint of the four phonon contribution. Uh, and then finally you start seeing, you stop seeing the individual phonons, you start seeing this, this envelope uh, and the impulse approximation is, is valid. Uh, and so all this means is uh, these individual phonon pieces over here is uh, if you take uh, this exponential over here and you expand this to leading or and just expand this in Q, uh, the leading piece is the single phone on the second piece of the two phone on and so forth and so forth. At sufficiently high Q, you can no longer expand this exponential uh, and you're, ex you're, you're basically asymptoting to this impulse approximation business. But for us, what it means is that as long as the uh, momentum transfer is of the order of roughly twice um, the square root of uh, the phonon frequency with the nuclear mass, we're, we're allowed to, to use this uh, uh, impulse approximation. So the main point I wanna make here is that the relevant energy scale is not the height of the potential well, but it's the gradient of the potential well near the origin, which is essentially the frequency of the phonons. Now, so that was just like a slight uh, uh, detour if you want. So now let's go back to uh, the Migdal effect and like uh, 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 dealing with the electrons. Uh, and so we're gonna deal with this uh, in, in perturbation theory. So this is the same diagram that I showed before uh, uh, where the dark matter comes in. This is a, 
leading order perturbation theory in the dark matter nucleon coupling, which is usually very small, and then uh, a leading order power in alpha, where we're going to excite the electron, uh, the electronic system in some ways. Now, the, uh, and so what we just showed, we work if we work in impulse approximation, we have to treat this gadget here as a bound state. Uh, but uh, as long as we're in this limit, it's, it's legal to uh, treat the initial and the final state and then the immediate states as plane waves for, for the ions, which really simplifies the calculation. So the final part that we're missing now in order to just do this, this calculation is uh, how to deal uh, with uh, the electrons themselves. Uh, and so for this, I want to give you some intuition uh, uh, couple back to your intuition from, from quantum field theory and the optical theorem in particular. Uh, so, so we're looking for this virtual process over here. And so let's uh, remember that the Coulomb potential uh, in a medium is, is, is just given by this. So there's the usual one over k squared because it's a long range force, long range force. Uh, and then there's the, uh, the dielectric function uh, uh, because we're in a, in a material which screens uh, the, the Coulomb force effectively. And so this in general is also a, a, a dependent momentum and the frequency at which we're probing uh, the system. So in QFT language, what you would say is like, well, okay, normally the photon propagator in vacuum is just one over K squared. And then there's some stuff in the numerator for, for gauge invariance and so on. Um, but uh, in a material, all, 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 all you get is you, you, you multiply with this one over uh, E squared. So this is the dress propagator in some way. So there's this blob over here. There's electrons uh, running, running a loop uh, that modify this propagator. And in the non-relativistic limit, this thing looks like this. Now, what we're interested in is, is dissipation. So we're not necessarily interested in, if we're doing Bram's trawling, we're just interested in this object. Uh, but if we're interested in, um, uh, finding electrons, what we want to do is we want to cut this diagram in half and, and, uh, and open up this loop in some ways and see what the electron states uh, are coming out and putting those on shell. Uh, and so in the quantum field theory, what you do is you take the imaginary part of this propagator, uh, which, is, uh, which is what we're doing over here. And this also works uh, in, in, in quantum mechanics and in, in solid state physics. Uh, so, that, so this is uh, known as the energy loss function, this uh, uh, imaginary part of a one over uh, epsilon. And it's a very important um, uh, object when, when, when people look at uh, how ions lose energy in, uh, in a material. Um, you can show, uh, as we might do tomorrow, uh, tomorrow uh, that uh, the imaginary part, so this, this you can just rewrite as follows, right? So by just using uh, uh, complex analysis. Uh, that the imaginary part of, of, the, uh, of epsilon is exactly the matrix element that, Tung -Yang, uh, that, that Tian Tian uh, taught you how to compute uh, last week. And the main difference that we have here is that we also have this epsilon squared factor, which provides uh, some amount of screening uh, in the denominator. Uh, OK, so now we have all the various pieces. Uh, I, I'm not going to go through the full calculation. It, it's, it's, uh, you can find it in some appendix here. Uh, it's, it's not complicated in the sense it's just straight up quantum mechanical perturbation theory, but it's a bit tedious in the sense that uh, we're working, you, you have to work with block wave functions and so on. And so the notation gets a little bit annoying and the, the formulas get very long. Uh, but the final answer is uh, uh, this object over here. This, entire, this is the total rate, the scattering rate. Uh, and you see again, it's proportional to the Z ion and there's a, a power of alpha and so on. This is the energy loss function. This is the propagator over here of this uh, ion here in the middle. Uh, you could include a dark matter form factor. So for instance, if you're doing uh, um, that, that comes from this interaction over here. So suppose that you're doing a, a massless mediator, then there will be a one over Q to the fourth uh, um, uh, factor over here. that You've presumably also seen with uh, Tian Tian or someone else. And then this is a crystal form factor, which is essentially just some Gaussian that comes from the fact that these things are plane waves here, but this guy is not. Uh, and so you need to compute the overlap between uh, uh, the, the bounce, bounce state in a harmonic potential with a plane wave. And that gives you an additional form factor over here. In a high momentum limit, this again translates to just a, um, uh, a delta function. Uh, and then finally, <laughs> you see there's like a, a very large number of integrals to do. 
uh, which which is uh, slightly tedious, but it, it's fine. We can, we can also do, deal with this. Uh, in particular, uh, we can again go to the soft limit uh, in the same way that uh, uh, Joseph and Chris did for uh, Bramstrahlen. Uh, and we can write the, the total uh, ionization probability as uh, the double differential probability of the energy deposit in the nuclei and the energy deposit in electrons. Uh, and then in, in this soft limit, uh, again, it factorizes as uh, the elastic cross-section times some ionization probability over here. And this is given by, by this object here, where again, the loss function is, is important. Um, this is a plot. Of, of, of this object uh, for uh, a, a typical recoil of 100 EV or so. Uh, and you see that uh, it's always much smaller than one. So, so clearly, uh, as, as one would expect, the elastic process is always much larger than the Migdal effect. Uh, but that, that's exactly what we expect. It's a subleading process, but it allows us to uh, extract like uh, or 10 EV of, of electron energy or so, which many detectors now can, can also see. Um, uh, the other thing that you're seeing here is uh, the difference. It, so so it, it's also uh, relevant to include the momentum dependence on the ion, just like Joseph and Chris did for Bremstrahlen. Uh, and you can see here the difference uh, between these, uh, what, what happens if you, if you just fix it or whether if you include uh, this momentum dependence. Uh, here, are, uh, here are some plots. Uh, the main thing here uh, that I want to draw your attention to is that uh, if you're going to very low masses, uh, below 30 MeV or so, uh, the impulse approximation breaks down and you see the theory uncertainties on the calculation start blowing up. And so we essentially don't have a, a calculation anymore. So at the moment, this is still an unsolved problem, how to do this full calculation here without assuming that you have plane waves uh, in the intermediate state and in the final states, uh, which is a bit more of a mess. So, so all of this will get quite a bit more complicated. Uh, and in order to uh, make a prediction for the experimentalist of what happens in this region over here, uh, we, would, we would somehow have to solve that, that theory problem. That said, you can repeat this entire exercise for like a large number of materials. And, and that's what you see over here. You see that silicon and germanium are pretty optimal. Uh, the reason is that they have a fairly low band gap. Uh, and as you can see here, this thing scales uh, like one over omega to the fourth, this ionization probability, uh, which means that if you, if you have a low band gap, this is the energy into the electrons, uh, you, you benefit and you get a fairly large enhancement. Uh, so that means that in a crystal, this is actually, the rate is quite a bit larger than it is in, uh, in, a, in a liquid xenon, for instance. Um, okay, so, so this, this whole business is somewhat uh, uh, numerically complicated because you have to first compute uh, the energy loss function and then do all the integrals. And so, so we've summarized all of this in like a a small Python package that uh, we will work a little bit with uh, in the exercise session tomorrow um, that lets you do all of these things uh, without having to go to the same, uh, same mess in some ways. It does a few other things like electron scattering, if you may talk about tomorrow. Uh, you can do phonon scattering, which is also something we'll cover tomorrow as well as uh, absorption. All right, uh, so, so I think I'm gonna uh, wrap up and leave the last five minutes for uh, questions just for uh, want to mention for tomorrow's uh, discussion session. Uh, we're gonna uh, play a little bit with Python. Uh, so, so if you don't have it already handy, I would suggest that you, you get a Python 3 installation uh, with NumPy and SciPy, which comes with most standard scientific Python environments. Uh, and so, so I find it handy to uh, use Jupyter as a, a, an interface for, for Python. Uh, the most straightforward way I think to install these things is, is to install like a full uh, scientific Python environment. And, and I've been pretty successful with Anaconda in particular, uh, which installs fairly easily and has all these things, uh, all these things built in. Uh, we're going to be making some plots. Uh, so if you're not uh, familiar with uh, making plots with Python, that's totally fine. Uh, you can export the data to a, a text file and make plots with Mathematica or with whatever uh, plotting software uh, that, you, that you are uh, most familiar with. 
uh, but uh, so the data will be will be produced with, with Python. So once you once you have uh, this installed, uh, it would be great if you could go to this uh, uh, GitHub page uh, and and download uh, the package. And, and you don't need to compile it; just uh, unpack it, uh, and then hopefully you can run one of the example notebooks uh, without things crashing. Um, no compilation is needed. Okay, so so that's it for for announcements. And so then let's summarize uh, the physics, right? Uh, so, so there are two main inelastic processes that people have considered so far. So they are both uh, inelastic on the standard model side, specifically in terms of uh, electromagnetic interactions. Uh, and so these give us, uh, we pay a big penalty in terms of cross-section. However, uh, we get access to uh, dark matter candidates for which the electron, the, the, the elastic recoils are below threshold. And this is especially important for experiments which have a fairly high threshold, like xenon, CDMS, and some of the more traditional dark matter experiments. Uh, as we mentioned, this comes with a price in rate, so there's no free lunch, of course. Uh, and, and depending on your point of view, there's some, some fun or pain to be had uh, to compute some of these things on the theory side. Um, the Migdal trick, uh, where you basically boost to the frame of the recoiling atom, works really nicely for atomic targets. Uh, but for crystals, you need to be a bit more careful, uh, and it pays off to just use the, the regular perturbation theory. Uh, and then finally, uh, uh, for, for low mass dark matter, it's somewhat an unsolved problem. Uh, it's most apparent in crystals, where, where it really uh, hits you in the face. Uh, that the impulse approximation breaks down. However, I should mention that the, the calculation in the usual Migdal style by eBay and company uh, also actually secretly relies on the adiabatic approximation when they, when they use this particular matrix element. It also assumes that the collision happens fast at the typical time scales at which the electrons can respond. Uh, and so at some level, uh, for, for low mass dark matter, this, this will also start breaking at some point. And so this is still an area of research that this is not a, not a solved problem yet, how to self-consistently do all of this when these various approximations break down. All right, I will stop here and take any residual questions you may have. <laughs>